4.13 p.m. Central Daylight Time, Sunday, August 28, 2005. Extremely dangerous Hurricane Katrina continues to approach the Mississippi River Delta. Devastating damage expected. Most of the area will be inundated for weeks, perhaps longer. At least one half of well-constructed homes will have roof and wall failure. All gabled roofs will fail, leaving those homes severely damaged or destroyed. The blown debris will create additional destruction. Persons, pets, and livestock exposed to those winds will face certain death if struck. When we think about the failures at all levels of government during the response to Hurricane Katrina, a few key aspects of decision making come to mind. There were non-decisions, decisions deferred, and poor decisions. The worst of these were in preparation, both long term and immediately before the storm made landfall. It's important to understand that no decision, in fact, is a decision. A delayed decision is a decision, and a panic decision is a decision and it often amounts to no decision. These played out before, during, and after Hurricane Katrina in six salient ways, and in hindsight, only one of these six decisions was in fact correct. Decision one, the emergency plans were not based in reality. Actually, state plans were reasonable and suitably adaptable, but the governor and senior staff did not really know what had been signed and were not fully aware of executive responsibility and prerogatives nor were parishes and municipalities. In addition, City of New Orleans plans assumed, against all reality, the availability of certain municipal workers who at the time were in contract dispute, nor did the city leadership know or even try to execute evacuation plans in place. Lesson, know what you're signing in a signature decision. Decision two, the assumption of the predominance of private transportation was valid and in, was essential. This was the one bright spot in a dismal episode in U.S. disaster response. Modern American cities assumed the use of cars on highways as the principal means of transportation. Not without problems, the departure by private automobile was largely a success. The contraflow put in place increased outbound volume by some 70%. Certainly there were lessons to be learned, but that's quite different from a never to be repeated disaster. Lesson, private owned vehicles are a transcendent reality of American life. Include them in emergency plans, as was accomplished here. Decision three, the availability of public transportation workers was assumed. 
with disastrous consequences. New Orleans evacuation plans assume both regional transportation authority bus drivers and Orleans Parish school bus drivers would be employed to evacuate people. Few of these people were actually engaged and few were willing to be engaged. They had their own families to evacuate and their job descriptions did not include duties akin to that of a first responder or a soldier. Lesson. Do not designate someone to be a soldier who has not taken the oath of office. And in any case, do not put anyone in the position of having to decide between family and civic duty. But even if your plan is to train National Guard troops to act as bus drivers for evacuations, it is important to note that during the first hours and days of the crisis in New Orleans, the National Guard could not reach many areas where buses were both available and operational. In at least one case, a Louisiana Wildlife and Fisheries official directed several civilians to attempt to hotwire school buses that had not been destroyed by wind and water. Within 30 minutes, the buses were being loaded with stranded people. The National Guard had not yet arrived. Decision 4. Special needs populations were not considered, seemingly placed in a too hard category. The ill, the infirm, the elderly, people of limited English, and animals were not considered. This was, in fact, a no-decision decision with tragic results. The problem does not have a 100% solution in the offering, but can be ameliorated. Lesson, if it's true that a government's principal duty is to the least of its citizens, there is much work to be done with respect to emergency evacuations. Remember, people consider their pets part of their family and will act accordingly. This aspect of disaster response planning is hardly started in the United States. Decision 5. Specificity in emergency response needs was lacking to the point of indecision. The state sent boilerplate requests to Washington just before the storm and in the aftermath. Their cut and paste requests just wanted everything. By comparison, the city of New Orleans requests were, if anything, less coherent. Requirements for assistance and relief must be specific as to who, what, when, and where. None of that kind of cogent thought existed until General Honoré and Admiral Allen arrived on the scene. Lesson. There is no crystal ball at some higher level that can discern acute needs and pass to relief. Those in need must articulate specific requirements in a clear, concise, and timely manner. Decision 6. Emergency communications had not been thought through. Though the assumption of automobile use worked for New Orleans, the assumption that communications would somehow be sustained was erroneous. Adequate signage and no comms plans could have compensated for some of this. The daily use of all forms of media communications, phone, internet, texting, Twitter, Facebook, radio, TV, cannot infuse and confuse crisis planning. It did during and after Katrina, and in reality, the only thing the mayor had control of during the storm was a desk located high in a hotel without any lights. Lesson, decide what the worst case scenario is and plan for it. This may mean signs and messengers.
So what are the potential impacts to the U.S. national surface transportation system to large-scale events or attacks that do not directly involve transportation as a target? The project findings indicate that all disasters, regardless of cause, sector, or focus, will involve the national transportation system, even if it is not directly impacted. As a result, all preparedness and response plans must account for the operational reality that they are dependent upon surface transportation and that crisis communications and information sharing must be initiated in ways that make use of the transportation infrastructure as a resource. Failure to address these issues early elevates the risk of delayed response times, delayed recovery due to impeded travel and supply, and delayed investigation, deterrence, and apprehension. Based on both the D.C. area sniper attacks and Hurricane Katrina case studies, there are common key missed opportunities or systemic failures that, if identified and leveraged, could have aided in better protecting and managing the national transportation system during these crises. First, operationally sound crisis communications plans could have enhanced the ability to leverage the transportation system as a crisis response tool. Indicators are that the lack of an operationally sound, practiced, and fully implemented crisis communications plan is a systemic issue that impacts response. Second, both events showed little appreciation for the critical role that the U.S. national transportation system plays in preparing for and responding to both natural and man-made crises. It is clear that the transportation infrastructure and available assets must be documented, managed, and exercised so that crisis managers understand how best to leverage these resources during an emergency. And finally, we've seen clearly that there are significant risks associated with not leveraging the National Infrastructure Protection Plan and the Critical Infrastructure Key Resources Support Annex to the National Response Framework. For the Tougaloo College National Transportation Security Center of Excellence, Thanks for watching.